I'd like to introduce Warren Jobbit, our host of our first Tech Talk. And Warren, take it away. Thanks, AJ. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is a pretty exciting evening for me. It's uh, an evening of learning. I encourage all of you to, not on your computer, but in your in your mind, hit Control Alt Delete, and you know, just open your mind to some some new ideas and and ways to to start your season. As we said, this is this TED Tech Talk is about your first days on snow. But for myself, you know, this is I focus on this to start my season, but it's an ongoing sort of process for me every day. So let's get into you know, what it is we're going to to cover tonight. One of the things I'll be doing is showing a, a number of videos. So ensure that your volume is turned up pretty high to make sure that the volume comes through because I'll have those narrated. But uh, here's what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about our physical approach to our first day and all of our days on snow. Um, that combined with the mindset that you take onto snow are going to create your experience. That's how it's going to generate what your day is going to be like. We're going to cover off a few things in each. These there's a picture of skiing to try to keep things as simple as possible, but wrap our heads around you know, technique just a little bit. And then I'm going to leave you with some drills that you can take out on snow on your first day and every day thereafter. We'll talk about the cognitive approach to your, your time on snow, choosing a mindset, and then how you're going to progress throughout the day. So ground rules, let's get started here. First and foremost, we're out skiing, we're on a slippery slope. That doesn't change. And the reason why I say this is if I'm standing at the top of a slope and I just let myself go, I'm going to start sliding down the hill. I'm going to start gaining momentum. And so the skier is what has the momentum. And what we want to do is change the direction of that momentum and we ski on an arc. So unless you're just straight running it all the time, uh, this talk is going to be based around the fact that we're actually arc to arc. So here's a quick video that's going to show you how I picture and think of, of arcs on the snow. Oops, sorry. All right. So two components when I talk about skiing on an arc. Um, one of our turn shape was the width of your corridor. And then the other is the vertical drop from one fall line or apex of an arc all the way to the next. So when we're talking about skiing and about turn shape, they're within those two points. There's the width of the corridor and then, of course, the vertical drop. Let's watch this skier here at full speed. There we go. Turn shape. Great. So there's, there's our turn shape. Um, so when we talk about that throughout the evening and, and when you're on snow, that's what I want you to, to picture is we've got a, a width of our corridor and then how far down the slope we go as we change direction. A couple more ground rules. Number one, so that change of direction comes from our skis. Our skis are the tools that we use to put us on an arc, go from one side of the slope and start heading to, to the other side. It is most efficient and effective when we're balanced on the outside ski. I had a really cool talk with Sasha Rierich, who is the head coach of Ted Ligeti when he was in his prime. And I asked him, you know, what made a certain skier faster than others? And his comment was the, the racer who could go from one outside ski to the next fastest, most efficiently and effectively was the one who typically was fastest down the slope. It doesn't change for us whether we're trying to go you know, if we're in a snowplow with beginner skiers or if we're out on the slope going at expert speeds, we still want to be going from outside ski to outside ski. My last piece of ground rules is there's points of contact that we need to feel at all times. And regardless of where you're skiing, the terrain, the conditions, the size of your turn, your speed, these are your three points of contact that we always want to look for. Here's our three points of contact. One, being the first met head. Two, your heel pad. And three, always maintaining shin contact. 
This drill is one that I do every morning, especially early on in the season, where I want to hop from my uphill foot to my downhill foot and try to stomp the landing and hold that position there. Okay? Always trying to land those three points of contact on every single landing. You'll notice in order to balance, if I can balance on that downhill ski, there's a little bit of counter in the upper body. You can see that in here. I also have adjusted the upper body, the shoulder, this direction. So we start to get this angle forming that keeps the weight towards the outside foot as well. And a couple of commonalities here where things start to stay level from the hips and down to the feet. I do this drill on both sides, obviously. And as you get better, you, you can hop further so there's a little bit more uh, impact that you have to be able to balance against. There you go. So those are our ground rules for this evening. We're on a slippery slope. We have momentum when we're skiing. We redirect that momentum from arc to arc. We utilize the outside ski to do that. And we always, regardless of what we're doing, we want to be on our three points of contact at all times. So let's take a grander look at technique and, and just to make it as simple as possible. And uh, we're, I group different movements for skiing and so on and so forth. So we'll look at that next. If we're adhering to these ground rules that we've laid out, the fact that we're on a slippery slope, gravity's pulling us down the mountain, we're redirecting our momentum on an arc, we're using our skis as the tool to do so, then there are movements that we're going to have to make that will affect what the ski is doing on the surface of the snow to change our direction. I group these movements for certain purposes. And the first one I look at is the red section here. There are movements that we will make as skiers that will efficiently and effectively change our momentum. If you look at this, if you follow this arc from this apex of the turn all the way to the apex of the next turn, our momentum is going from what you're seeing as the right side of the screen to the left side of the screen. So in this area here, this is where you'll see movements that will change our direction from going from one side to the next. From there, what I see is there's specific movements to undo that, right? To release that direction change. And then in this section of the glide phase that I call it, where we're gliding, and I'm creating a new platform to then be able to make certain movements that will allow me to redirect my momentum. So the green section I call gliding. The first section is the release. The second section is the platform development. And then we get back into the red section here where we're changing the momentum or the direction of our skier. Watch and you can see uh, as the skier comes through these different sections, there's movements in here to redirect, movements in here to release, movements to create a platform, and movements to balance on that outside ski so it redirects the momentum of the skier. We're also going to make sure that we're watching this in full speed because that's how everything happens in our world. So take a look at full speed. So now we're going to take a closer look at these three sections, direction change, the release, and the platform creation. Okay, so you know, I find in skiing, there's really only a few movements that we use that will have us change direction, release that direction change, create a new platform. And skiing is quite simple. Uh, it's hard to perfect, as we all know, as we're always trying to do. But there's, uh, there's that you know, keeping things simple. So these next three videos are going to group, you know, some of the movements that are made in each of those sections. And that'll help us just get that bigger picture in our mind of what skiing is and what it can be for all of us.
I'm going to start here with that red zone, the direction change. The main reason for starting there is we all start traveling down the mountain and the first thing we do is we make a little direction change before we get into you know, the flow and the, and the rhythm of the run. So that's why I'm starting here. You know, the idea you're know, looking at in that previous video, this is the area that we're going to be focusing in on and the movements that our bodies are making in order to ensure that it's the balance is on the outside ski. I have my three points of contact, the met head, the heel pad, the shin contact, and that it senses, you know, the sense of weight is under the outside ski, or the majority of it is under the outside ski. So let's watch here some of the movements that are required. You know, there's one where I have to think about bringing my armpit towards my outside foot, and we'll see this a little bit further on tonight as well. But there's a move to keep that body connected to the outside ski. You'll see there's still counter in the, the between the upper and the, the lower body in here. The leg it tends to bend a little bit as as we get you know the inside leg looks like it bends a bit more as the ski continues to roll over steeper onto its edge and the hip looks like it gets closer to the snow as a result of the the ski tipping over more, right? And that line of inclination getting steeper in there. Right? And always trying to stay balanced against that outside ski as the forces build, you know, as the, the, the sense of the force gets greater as we get closer to the fall in the apex of the arc and then starts to direct our momentum in the opposite direction. Okay, so you know, very simple movements in, in that part of the arc. Let's take a look now at how we release that because you see how the body you know, it starts bending, it's twisting and, and counter and all those types of things, steep angles. So how do we get rid of that so we can do it again on the other side? Now that we've changed direction and our momentum is going from one side of the slope and heading to the next side of the slope, some of the things you'll see here is you know, this indicates our center of mass. It's well inside our feet. Everything is tipped over. We've got that counter, the connection to the outside foot, the outside ski. So somehow we have to release that. So let's take a look at the movements that help us release ourselves from inside so we can end up back over top of our skis and create a new platform for another direction change. So we start to balance, oops, sorry, we start to balance on the new ski that we're going to, to eventually create a platform with as we release and control the release of the center mass with the old outside ski. The trick is to maintain majority of your balance and sense of weight or pressure on the outside ski as we start to balance on the inside ski as the center of mass starts to move up from down here, coming up over top of the feet there. Okay, so here it is, start to balance on your ski, control the release with the old downhill ski by slight bending of the joints, and then that's what allows the center of mass to, to come back up. Now, there are many different ways that you can get your center of mass from the inside back over top of your skis. You can stem the uphill foot, you can push off the uphill foot, um, and all work just fine. But which one is more efficient and effective? And it's just that slight little bend, and it's only a small amount. Maybe it's an inch or two, but it's enough to just change your line of inclination and start what we call the toppling effect. Here it is in a you know more a little bit more fall line-ish arc you can see how there's balance moving to the outside new outside ski as the downhill ski starts to release a little bit taking one more quick look as we go through here one of the other aspects i want you to focus in on is you know this you know that counter the separation remains it's not a ton but it's enough to give us what we call anticipation and that's going to be important when we start looking at how we create 
and build our new platform that we'll talk about in the next video. There you go. I'm going to move straight into platform creation. And that's the last of our three sort of phases, if you will, or sections of the arc that we were looking at earlier. Now we're looking at creating a new platform that will redirect the momentum of our skier going from one side of the slope to the next. So this is kind of coming full circle now back to the video a couple of videos ago. As I mentioned in the last one, it's really important to manage our counter. Um, this is typically called anticipation, maybe a word that you've heard in the past, but this is where eventually I'm going to be going. So it makes sense that that's where our upper body is facing. We don't want to position it there. Uh, it just happens to, to be there because we had counter to stay connected to that outside foot. Remember our three points of contact without that counter we're not going to get there and again we're going to talk more about that this evening so let's take a look at the you know we've released the uh, the center of mass it's over top of the base of support now now we've got to engage this new ski here to create a platform of which we're going to then change direction And this is the section that we're talking about. So as the center of mass goes over, crosses and ends up on the new outside ski in here. Now this is obviously a carved arc. If we were skiing a bit slower, we'd be a little bit more vertical, of course. But regardless, that we end up creating a line of inclination that you know obviously gives us an edge angle, but that's what we're going to balance against as we continue to move on to our direction change. And here are some of the movements that we look at uh, to create that platform. Again, this is high speed. There's a rolling over of the foot. And then there's using, we use the adductor group of muscles in here to also get the leg to adduct inward. And that's what creates that platform. We also, you know, I'm focusing on the, the outside ski, of course, but the same thing would happen with the inside leg. But if you do this type of movement and you focus on your outside leg, trust me, the inside leg will probably be in the right spot. Roll, create that line of inclination. And one thing to remember at this point is as we're starting to come down towards the fall line, so we have to engage the calf muscles, the hamstrings, and that's what keeps us in contact with the front of the boot. Here's a little bit of a, a shorter arc again. Watch the leg. You know, the ski rolls over, the leg adducts inward, and that's what gives us our new platform to which then we're going to connect and redirect. Perfect. Let's carry on. Sorry, Warren, we have you on mute still. Hang on a sec, just so we don't miss you. There you go. I told you I was going to do that at least once tonight. So there it is. <laughs> Sorry. The uh, So what I was saying is those three videos, they're based on performance skiing, right? So carving and, and higher speed, not necessarily steeper, steeper slopes, but definitely more on the performance end of things. And so the, the movement patterns for me, the real basic, the cornerstone is the ability to, what as I described, connect to the outside ski. And we're gonna go to that in a short bit here to more detail on that. Then we have movements that are going to, you know, slight bend and balance on the new ski to help release that. And then a rolling of the foot and using the adductor group of muscles to tip the, help tip the ski over. Those three foundational movements are there everywhere I go, whether I'm in a snow plow, whether I'm on groomed terrain or bumps or powder, those are always there. I know there's times where we can't obviously carve our entire arc. Maybe it's steeper. Maybe we need a narrower corridor. So sometimes we need to add 
what I call my part-time move, the one that I'll use to help get me pointed down the hill so I can connect and, and make a shorter turn to control my speed or to create a little bit more of a skidded arc. So I'm going to show you that real quickly so we have sort of the whole picture here. Just so we have the reference of the, the platform creation at slower speeds where we need to twist the ski on the surface of the snow that creates some friction that helps us balance and we don't have the, the speeds and the forces to balance on a really steep line of inclination. So that's one of the reasons why we have to twist the ski on the surface of the snow. So as I create my platform, you know, everything, you know, the skis and the body starts to twist, you know, and face a little bit more down the hill. Watch as we will get another one in here as well. So from this point here, you know, the, the body needs to, we need to stand up just a little bit straighter to get over top of the, 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 the base of support, right? So I can twist it on the surface of the snow. Okay, so watch again in here and just, right? So the skis have turned, so they're pointing down the hill. There's still a line of inclination. It's a little bit straighter or a little bit, not you know, it's not as on a steep angle as the, the carved arc was, but there's still that line of inclination and then we're going to connect and release. And there's the twist, right? So we come from here, as we turn the skis, we point them down the hill so we can then balance, create a little bit of friction, and that's what's gonna help us change direction. Great. So I know there's a, there's a lot of information in a short period of time, the, uh, but I think it's important for us to understand, to see a target that we're heading towards. So when we get on snow our first day or every day thereafter, that if we run through and we're going to show you a series of drills here that will hopefully clarify some of the stuff we just talked about, but really give you something solid to take home with you and something to to try so let's get moving on here this first one carries on from that one of that first video i showed where i had my skis off and was kind of hopping from the uphill foot to the downhill foot so this one is is the extension of that now i add my skis to the same exercise I'm still trying to hop down the slope land now I'm trying to, in my mind, picture the platform that I'm trying to create early on in my arc. A little bit of counter, standing on the downhill foot. And you can see that you know, as I land and balance on that downhill ski, you know, here's a carved arc, so a higher speed arc. You know, do they look the same? How about if I turn it a little bit more onto its side? Different, hey? From there to there. So the exact same you know, type of thing, if I start looking into here where you know, that connection or the movement balancing against the outside foot, same sort of thing here, right? We're looking at this, you know, the, being level all the way up through the hip, same things happening here. And then also the counter, you know, this direction, you know, on this arc, I'm actually, you know, if you look from the head down, because I'm actually looking where I'm going, um, but you can still see that counter in the upper body to maintain that balance and the weight towards the outside foot. It's quite different, hey, when you look at it from here. You don't know if there's a whole lot of similarities, but when we just tip that picture onto its angle, you can see a lot of the similarities using this exercise to get your body moving in the way that you're going to need to when you're doing a high speed arc, even a slower arc, but building your platform. Okay, so that's a pretty interesting one. I found that you know taking even just a, a static exercise and seeing if you're moving properly, it applies directly to what you're going to do on snow. Sometimes the drills that we do 
can be more difficult than than skiing themselves. So finding drills that are going to create or recreate the movement. that you're going to need. Let's add motion to this same drill where you start sliding on the slope. I always choose a groom, green. Sorry, I, uh, I gave you the wrong video. Hold on a second. Uh-oh. It's happening in my screen. There it is. So I jumped ahead one. Here's the here's the proper one. Sorry about that. I think one of the most fundamental movements in skiing to balance and stay uh, you know, on the outside ski is the ability to bend laterally here, and it's using the upper body to help connect towards the outside foot. You know, by connect, what I mean is going from this type of line of inclination, things are a little bit longer, a little bit more vertical, to here where this armpit kind of comes down towards you know, the outside boot, and we get a little bit more angulation uh, look within the body itself. So once again, real quickly, you know, just taking the poles, and putting them in your elbows, lock your thumbs over top of the poles, and drop your grips or your tips, whatever end of the pole it is, straight down sideways. Okay, and that's what's starting to create this look in the body that we have all the way here. So it's the same sort of thing. That's how we create the angles. It's not about driving the hip down into the inside, so tipping the whole body over and then connecting to the outside foot okay so now we'll get you on to the uh, the proper video here where we take that same drill and we add motion down the slope let's add motion to this same drill where you start sliding on the slope i always choose a groom green slope if possible, right? Drop the grips to the outside boot, tips to the outside boot, you end up with the three points of contact, net head, heel pad, shin contact, as we discussed earlier, and we start to create these angles and look at the track in the snow as a result. Very simple movement pattern, just gets everything balancing to the outside, and it starts to create what we would typically call angulation. Lots of reward for a little bit of effort. <laughs> and isn't that what skiing is supposed to be, right? To be efficient and effective with all of our movements. And so one step further here, so one last piece of this progression, and this will wrap up the drill section. Let's put all of the movements in the previous drills to the test now. If our ground rules are three points of contact, that will put us in the middle of the ski. When we balance on that ski, it should bend a little bit and start to give us a bit of a carved arc. I'm on a green run here again, uh, so speed control isn't an issue. And I'm just putting into practice the movements that I was using in the previous drills. Can I, as a result, connect to the outside ski, balance on those points of contact, and lift my inside ski throughout the entire arc? We start looking at some of those images that we have in here, very similar, if not exactly, what we were accomplishing in our first drills that, uh, that we've done so far here. Again, these are drills that I do anytime I hit a flat piece of terrain, a cat track, uh, every day in the morning before I get rolling. And again, especially at the beginning of your season, trying to reacquaint yourself with balance while you're sliding on your skis. Excellent. So those are the, the drills 
in the the handout section before i forget there you can download a a pdf and it has those those uh, drills are described just a little bit but it'll also show you where on my website warrenjava.com you can find those uh, videos and watch them as many times as you wish so let's get into the mindset so if we know what it is we're trying to accomplish on snow with you know the technical side of things we have some of those pictures in our mind a bit of understanding of of our technical approach the other half and it's just as big is to build your mindset and the the approach you're going to take psychologically towards your on snow day it's a skill or as hard or <laughs> and as complicated to build as as any of our skiing skills so this is one of my favorite quotes that failure is an event and not a person and if i take that in and cherish it and kind of know that i'm going to make mistakes and have those oh no moments while i'm skiing those are the opportunities for us to learn i'm going to learn more from when i tried something and then had an oh no moment and it didn't work then if i try something and my instructor my course conductor my coach says yeah that was great but i don't recognize whether it was great or whether it was an oh no moment Carol Dweck has a lot of literature on the growth mindset, and I won't get deep into that, but if you take your the mindset of anything that happens to me on snow today is going to be a learning opportunity, then that's where you're going to be going. That is a, the growth mindset. With all of the different terrain, the you know, going from a, a you know a run where it goes flat and then it goes steeper, it gets icier people start going all you know in front of you uh there's so many unique problems that are going to present itself to us and if we have the the understanding and we're going to get to this here of you know, how what it is we should be doing and what should happen as a result it doesn't matter what condition you hit whether you have that oh no moment or not you're still going to be developing and, and learning as a skier so my mindset is this, I think of three things, precision, intention, and intensity. And what I mean by precision, I, and maybe I'm a little bit of a freak this way, but I never, I never do a run without deciding what move I'm going to focus on. What move is it that I'm working or developing in my skiing right now? And there's three things that I have to consider with that. Where is it that I'm going to make that move? above the fall line, after the fall line, but there needs to be a general area of where I'm going to, to make that move. There's a degree of every movement. So I could do it a little bit or I could do it a lot. And the last one is the rate in which we make that move. I could do it very quickly and I could do it quite slowly. And if you take all three of those components, where you do it, how fast you do it, how much you do it, and you put each of those on those dimmer switches, there's an infinitesimal number of solutions to those problems that we just talked about on the previous slide. If I do something quickly and a little bit, it'll have a different effect than if I do something slowly and a little bit, which takes me to the next part, my intention. Every move has to have a purpose and it's not to look like somebody, you know, that, that you've seen ski, it's to direct your momentum or redirect your momentum uh, with your skis. So the intention is, what is the results of my movement? And that will affect it, going back to what we talked about before, you know, the corridor, will it make it wider? Will it make it narrower? Will my vertical drop go longer or will it shorten? And will this move change the performance being more carved or more skidded? There has to be a purpose. And from there, we have to choose our intensity and intensity. I can tell you will change minute by minute. It certainly can, because that involves your knowledge, your uh, awareness of physically, where are you at at this moment? Psychologically, where are you at at this moment? And that can go from anywhere. And I take myself back to January 27th, 2019 uh, at about 1147 AM. Um, cognitive, you know, my psychological state was very good. My physical state was very good. Um, I hit a, a piece of terrain that caused me to break my leg. And the next time I was back on snow, 
I can guarantee you that both of those components were definitely not at the same level as they were the year previous. And that will change. It can change, like I said, minute by minute, day by day, week by week, run by uh, run by run. The important part of this is to recognize your limits. When are your legs feeling a little bit fatigued? When are you not as focused on the outcome? When can you no longer determine how much you're going to turn those dials? And when you know that, you want to try to train near those limits, but not beyond. And I have two solutions to where you find yourself at any given time. One is the terrain. You can always choose to go steeper or flatter. And you can always adjust your speed. You can add a little more twist if you need to slow things down a little bit more skidded, so on and so forth. And the last piece of the cognitive puzzle here is know before you go. And what I mean by that is if you don't have a plan or an understanding of A, the movements, where they're supposed to be in an arc, and what they're supposed to do for you, you're not going to understand contribution and effect, as I call it. Contribution meaning here's a move I'm going to give my arc, and here's the effect. Okay, so looking, just going back a couple of slides, you're knowing what move you want to make and knowing what it should do for you. Because if you have that, then if you get that oh no moment, maybe you need to change the dial a little bit. Maybe you need to make that move a little sooner, maybe a little bit later, maybe a little less, maybe a little bit faster. And as you play with those, those oh no moments will slowly take you to an aha moment when you'll realize the right blend of your movements and that will take you to the desired effect, the turn shape, the width of corridor and the vertical drop and whether it's more carved or more skidded. So here's our last little video. And are you a motion picture visualization person or are you an action stills person? Let's see what this one does for us. One of the keys to training, and especially getting back on snow for the first time in the early part of your season is how do you picture speed? Do you see it as a series of stills? You know, where you go, this is a picture I want to try to create, or potentially it's, you know, this one here where oh, I'm trying to stay low through transition, or maybe it's a picture like this where you're trying to get a longer leg, uh, trying to create a steeper line of inclination. These are all images, and we will all describe these images differently. But do we actually see what the body is doing, the moves that the skier makes in between each of these little sections? So do we see this in our head when we're looking at skiing, a series of all of these little pictures, you know? But these are positions as a sense. They're a very small moment in time, and it's not really connected. Where we want to go is to actually start viewing skiing in motion. And this is one area that I think people start to go towards when they visualize skiing in their head. It can, you know, we visualize it in slow motion, which is better than the stills, most definitely. But where we want to go is visualizing our skiing in full speed, because that's how it happens when we're out there skiing. So, and it's the movements that we make, and we're going to talk about that, that get us to flow from one arc to the next. It's not positions. And we'll talk, like I said, we'll talk more about that as the evening progresses. <laughs> when, I, when I initially put this, this slide deck together, I had that at the beginning. So we have already talked about <laughs> all of those things um, that I was cueing you at at the end. The point here being is we see so many, there, there's incredible amounts of, of visual on YouTube these days. There's great skiers out there, uh, people that I love to watch, um, you know, putting out videos. And where we, I think where we get stuck quite often is seeing somebody in a certain position, uh, you know, hip to the snow sort of thing. And then we move our hip down towards the snow. But as we watch tonight, potentially, the move that resulted in the hip being close to the snow was not actually moving the hip close to the snow. And that's the challenge here, right? Is to understand contribution and effect. What moves will result in what re, you know, turn shape? 
and how we look on our skis, how close your hip is to the snow or not, it's not really relevant because all of us, there's you know 123 of us on, on the show here tonight, and not one of us would, even if we made the exact same move at the same time, we likely all have different equipment on. Uh, we're all at different stages of our growth as, as skiers. And so, and you know, I've got a, a, you know, I had a broken right leg or left leg. I got a sore right hip at times. So how I, you know, my body forms to, to allow that to happen, the moves happen, I'm probably going to look slightly different than all of you and each one in itself. So that's one of the most important things to, to remember here from tonight is to not ski towards a picture, but understand the movements and the results and a motion picture is what I'd ask you to, to ski towards. A quick review, uh, you know, we, we talked a bit about some of the ground rules. Be aware of those. Th those are things that just don't change. They're there as a result of physics and science and things like that. There's a big picture to how we ski and then look at those drills, work through those as you build your season, uh, build your day, and then start looking at, you know, I highly encourage you if you have never really looked into your mindset and the cognitive side of things, and we didn't get deep into it tonight, we get a little bit, we'll get, we'll get a bit more into that um, in the next couple of shows as we go throughout, but, you know, that's a pretty important part of what we do and then know before you go. So you know, there's, uh, you know, I wanna thank you so much for spending your time with, with me here this evening. And it's been such an honor to, to talk to you and work with you. There's, uh, if you have your phone on you, maybe take a, you can take a snapshot of, of this screen, um, some of my contact information in there. And uh, maybe I'll see you in Ontario. We, I've got some camps, some two day camps. Uh, they're on, the, on my website, you'll see they're broken down into advanced and expert camps <clears throat> sorry the advanced camps are more you know sort of level ones level twos and threes and fours on the expert camps so reach out if you have any questions <clears throat> love to hear from you uh what you thought of of the evening as well so i'm going to turn it back over to aj here warren thanks so much um we do have a couple of questions that have popped up in the q a and i'm sure as we uh, wrap here now there may be others um Couple of couple of comments coming in, Isabella. Really appreciate that. Um, as I think as Warren um, has commented, we're going to come back to that. Uh, we've got a couple more sessions coming your way, so stay tuned. Um, and thanks for the positive uh, positive remarks. But for those of you with questions, um, and bear with us as we explore new tech here, um, I'm going to publish some stuff up on the screen, Warren, and maybe you can help us pick these off. Sure. So uh, Bruce had one for us. Um, and I've just published that. So are you seeing that on your screen now, Warren? I am not. Oh, no. uh, here I if I look at the corner screen, yes. <laughs> Sorry, everyone, okay. we're just learning this software a little bit too. Uh, can you explain counter, please? Yeah, I did a quick little type back to to Bruce on that one. Counter is simply a word that we use that describes when our skis are pointing in one direction and our upper body faces slightly across that it's not like it used to be in our straight ski days where you know our body had to really counter or counter rotate even something a word that we used to to use um so that's what counter is it's just allow you know, it's a, a natural way for our body to balance actually to balance and get our weight towards the outside ski excellent and i've got another one coming your way there you should have a couple of questions from tom tommy uh, hey, Warren, is there a particular part of the turn that you focus on the most in your own mind when you ski? If so, why? And what does it help you accomplish as a result? It's a good question, Tom. You know, I do tend to think most of the ability to connect, right, to balance on the, the outside ski through the moves we talked about here tonight, you know, through those drills. That's probably the spot I, I look to first. Um, from there, then it's immediately trying to create that new platform, right? Rolling the ski over, creating a new line of inclination and uh, getting the ski to, you know, some purchase on, on the snow. <clears throat> if I do get that connection, it gets the weight to the outside ski, the outside ski bends and helps us, you know, turn around the corner, if you will. And uh, as far as the platform goes, it gives me that ability 
to deal with the, 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 the terrain and have the time to then connect if and, and when needed. Excellent. Uh, and, and a follow up from Tom. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, you know, first and foremost, it's a technical thought. The and the reason for that is you know, we have these actions, right? And those actions are technique. We have feelings or sensations as a result of those actions. Having said that, no two of us here on the call tonight would actually have the same feeling. We would sense the results of our actions or the, the technical thought um, differently. We may, you know, I, I may, I've asked, I've had students in the past where if I, you know, ask them, can you feel the weight under your heel? And maybe their feet are frozen or maybe they just don't have the body awareness. So the feeling is something internal for me. Uh, when I work with my skiers, I would, I give, I say it, you know, make this move here for this reason, this outcome. It may or may not feel like this to you. This is what it feels like for me. So it gives them something to search for, but it's not necessarily the result. And kind of as I mentioned earlier, if we ski or teach what we feel, there's a really good chance. Technically, we're not doing what we think we're doing. And our show, our demonstration to our students is highly likely not what we're saying, the words coming out of our mouth. So the demonstration doesn't necessarily match the, um, the, 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 the show, right? The demonstration. Right on. Um, got about four more coming up. Um, uh, one from Michael there. All right. Thanks, Michael. So in connect one ski, why doesn't the form default to that of a javelin turn? as the inside ski is lifted and the outside ski is steered? That's an excellent question. So Michael, that, you, the javelin turn was a really good exercise and I've, I've done it a lot myself, um, but more back on the, the straight ski days and here's why. So on the straight skis, you know, we constantly had a, a turning effort. You know, we had to always kind of twist the ski a little bit as we edge it and you used to get you know, all of our weight and a couple of friends with the shovel of the ski at the beginning of the turn and then all our weight grab our dog and get on the tail of the ski to get it to bend and have some sort of arc to that um and so as a result we would end up with a little bit more counter or counter rotation or separation if you will we all kind of use those terms interchangeably a lot um so that's why if i'm you know, on a on a shape ski when we tip it over it bends and the ski is on an arc so if as I have balance and a little bit of counter to the outside ski, uh, but not as much. So when the inside ski lifts up off the snow, it's parallel to the outside ski. I think, let me just read that again. Yeah. And then as a result, you know, so I'm balancing on that outside ski and not continually twisting it. Our, again, counter is a balancing act. It's a way to gain balance on the outside ski. It's not necessarily there to face down the hill and therefore the skis won't cross. If you have a big time rotator in your class, by all means, take them to the other end of the spectrum, throw in a javelin turn as an exercise, but that's a slightly different exercise than the one that I had shown there. Awesome. Uh, we've got one for you from Rob Mathers. Uh, should be with you now, Warren. Here we go. Okay, Rob. So Rob's question is, how do you distinguish the glide phase from the direction change phase, especially when teaching more intermediate skiers? Relative to your di diagram, what separates the green from the red in the skier's perception when movement is obviously ongoing throughout the arc? It's the sections, the sections, Rob, are, are defined by movements, right? And so, and going back to the, the dials that we talked about, with the, with the dials, the faster I make a move, the more I make a move, the earlier I make a move will result in that direction change as an example, right? Then the moves that I make to release the fact that my center of mass, everything's tipped inside and kind of all contorted, um, those movements would be grouped in that glide phase, in, a, in the first glide phase. And then again, the movements grouped for the platform development side of the second part of the glide phase with 
intermediates or, or lower level skiers, the precision of those movements uh, and the ability to, to make those at the right time and the right amount is certainly not the same as it is for you or I or, or anybody on this call tonight. So what happens then is it takes a little bit longer for us to change direction. And therefore that real red section might get longer. And then if they're abrupt in their movements uh, to create a platform or to release or stand up maybe, then those sections would get a little bit um, shorter. So the perception of the skier, essentially, when they've gone from heading facing one side of the tree or trail to the other side of the trail, when they see that change, that's what I would group in or cue them into. That's when we're changing direction. And then we build in that glide phase. If I change direction and come more parallel to the, to the bottom of the slope, uh, then I'm going to, you know, my glide will not accelerate me. If I finish my change of direction and start to make the moves to release that and build a new platform more as a half heart shape and pointing more down the hill, then I'm actually, you know, I'm going to accelerate or, or gain a little bit more speed. So it all ties in to groups of actions for a purpose and don't forget the outcome. Awesome. Thanks, Warren. I'm realizing just not knowing the platform well enough. I'm going to publish the last couple questions that have come in so everyone will be able to see them. Uh, so you'll see a couple new questions pop up. We've got one from Michael, from Feng, uh, from Mark, Giovanni, and Bill. Um, and there's some similarity in those, but I'll let everybody see the questions that have been now published, and um, I'll let you have at them. So starting uh, starting with Michael. Great. Yeah, in regards to, to mindset, <laughs> how do you balance taking on challenges to improve and stay safe within your ability so you don't write off your season like I did in January 2019. Um, yeah, you, that's, you know, again, that's a, it's understanding your body and it's hard for not all of our, our students that come out have great body awareness, to be honest. Um, they won't notice necessarily when their legs are getting tired uh, or when they just have had too much to think about and it, it, process then we process information and movement slower that way that cognitive part of, of skiing so you for yourself we'll start with you and then go back to the students for yourself you know it's when when you tell yourself to do a move and it takes longer to occur than what you're hoping for uh, that's a sure sign that the, you know the legs are getting a little bit tired when you um feel things are happening late you know when you start to to lose the the grip on your skis and things like that and you're playing catch up all the time maybe you've lost the shin contact and the first met head you're spending more time on your heels again another sure moment that the legs are getting tired and they'll tire before you recognize it so you measure it your tiredness on the outcome first you know are you achieving that with the same precision like we talked about uh, a, a bunch of slides ago uh, for that part the mindset for me when i start to think of what just happened and we're going to talk a lot about this is i can't remember if it's our second session or our third session so stay tuned um but when we or it'll be our third session so when when i start to analyze my skiing as to oh what just happened to me I know that my the, the the mind is starting to shift to that protection side, that I'm getting tired, I'm not getting the results that I was having earlier on in the day. And so that's when I start to, to slow things down or just simply quit. You know, I typically, my training day, and this is what we talk about in our next session, uh, is about three hours long when I'm training, not when I'm just going out for a ski, but when I'm training and developing something in my skiing, because that's about my fitness level, the strength, and also the ability of sort of the amount of mind power that I have for the for the day. With our students, you have to you know, look for those cues of you know imbalance, right? And and not just you know not that they're potentially imbalanced all the time, but the movements that they were making to gain balance, uh, that's one of the big ones. And when our students start to be afraid, and it might be from one this exact same green run from one run to the next one chairlift ride to the next 
And when you hit all of a sudden, the student seems hesitant. They don't want to jump in behind you. They they wait a little bit longer. When, and this happened uh, to me just the other day with with some of my clients where I took off and you know all morning they were right behind me, right behind me. And it, they were just taking a little bit more time before they would take off to go because they, you know they're thinking about it and when you start overthinking what the teacher has been telling you what your coach has been telling you then that's when things start to slow down and things get dangerous so hopefully that helps a little bit answer the question i think and your then, next one would have been from uh, mark Pavetsian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So watching a lot of Euro ski instructors and they show different concepts of how to, when and completion phases, your thoughts working with these guys, girls and their outline of ski techniques. I'm not sure I understand that question, Mark. Can you clarify that just a little bit or maybe come, maybe come on live with your mic? Mark, you should be able to pose that question again in chat if you'd like, if you're still tuned in with us. Uh, so maybe we'll come back to that one. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. Let's let's definitely come back to it. Uh, different skiers, height, weight. Make, this is Giovanni making the same turn. They achieve the same result using different muscles, body position, uh, contribution, and effect. Um, yeah, it, sure. Definitely. I think that there's efficiency and effectiveness for every movement that we make there's you're going to see just because of you know you know somebody's body height for one you know when i watch a you know a, somebody who's six foot six versus somebody who's five foot five make the exact same movement and let's say it's the ability to balance on the outside ski connect that taller skier will have a look of more counter just because those lines get further apart. And so you get to see, you know, that, that spread of the, of the angles. Um, when we're making different movements for the same result, um, and that's where things can get a little bit fuzzy, I think, to me, as far as technique goes. Uh, have I taught people to rotate before? Absolutely, but that's what they needed at the time uh, to accomplish a certain turn shape. But at the end of the day, if the technical approach is simple and you know contribution and effect oriented um, how the skier looks if they're making that move um, is not really a big deal right but if the move isn't there and they have to add something different then that's when you probably want to go back to some of the basics and move them forward from there um bill any tips on how to keep the outside ski from splaying out or another way to ask drive the ski parallel through the turn um there there's a couple of reasons why we get the you know that v or the the tips splaying out um if you're looking at the outside ski uh, when we're if, if we're behind center then the weight's going to be more towards the tail of the ski and the shovel isn't going to bend to pull us towards the fall line. And therefore it goes a little bit straighter, even though the tail of the ski is starting to push us on our arc. So that's one when, when things are a little bit too far back. When, if the outside ski is tracking properly, but the inside ski is the one that sort of turns more up or inside the arc a little bit more, that can be one turning with the upper body just a little bit too much, or the actually the opposite if i've opened my hips too much but then that brings my hips back inside and has the same effect and but if the ski was the outside ski was bending then if you're going to end up with that inside ski um you know kind of turning away from the the you know uphill from your downhill ski tip so hopefully that answers your question amir um what if instead of twisting outside knee and leg to inside the turn, we do it on the initiation of the turn with the inside knee and leg of the turn. In this way, wouldn't be the faster without skidding on the snow. 
Um, I think I understand your question, Amir. I'll answer it if if it's not if my answer isn't clear what you're getting at, then uh, we can come back around to it. Um, you know, for me, outside ski is is the one that I always focus on because with everything being attached, if I am properly aligned on the the downhill ski when I start to initiate with the uphill ski, um, then the inside leg is going to do what it needs to do. A lot of PIC people training movement with their inside leg to release uh, the old arc. Typically, they're doing that because the alignment with the outside ski was off to start with. So that's, in my opinion, that's a makeup move to that isn't required if you have the proper alignment prior to that moment. Um, the second half of your question, the I, I'm not sure that it would you know, turning the inside ski more than the outside ski or first would have the effect of um, turning faster. The the skidding action it's a you know it's a result of twisting the skis on the snow. Um, if you're getting skid but you're actually trying to carve, I think that's a different situation. Um, and there's probably a number of reasons uh, why that's happening. But at the end of the day, I would encourage you to you know, follow, go through some of these drills we did tonight or we talked about tonight and see if if that approach makes makes the difference that we're looking for. And awesome. And Warren, I did get a little bit of clarity from um, from Mark just through the chat back and forth. So he had asked you initially about just the differences he sees in European ski instructors um, and, and specifically what, what, is it that, what is it that's causing that difference in your opinion? So their approach to technique, um, and I'm just going back to it so I get it right, what are they doing a little bit differently than we do and, and why um, was sort of where he wanted to go. I don't know if that helps with, with his question for you, though. Mm -hmm. Did he say anything specific about the di what what differences we're looking at? No, that's I'd ask Mark that one is just uh, you know is there anything specific that you were spotting that that Warren could speak to for you? Got it. Um, you know, there's a couple of different things that I see going on uh, right now. There's um, you know, when I look at some of my favorite European skiers, I'm looking at guys like Patrick Batts right now, Keely Weevil. Um, uh, oh, what's her name? Ah, I'm sorry, lost it. Um, the lot, the, the movement patterns that they're making are very similar to, or exactly what we're, we're talking about here tonight. There, there's certainly a number of people, um, who got this idea that hip to the snow is is sexy maybe uh, whatever whatever the purpose is for that uh, which but that takes us away from the outside ski especially the front of the outside ski uh, we're fortunate enough that with the, the the shape of the tail of the ski when I get my you know the butt down to the snow idea the the, the width of the tail is what's pushing us around the corner and giving us that sensation of carving uh, but it isn't as efficient as, you know, staying, you know, you know, a little less, you know, hip back and down inside and a little bit more aligned with the outside ski. Like we looked at some of our, our stomping drills there and engaging the front of the ski and having that pull you around the corner as well. So that's one thing uh, that I see that's different from maybe what we were talking about here tonight. So that'd be the one that, that, that I would lean towards, I think. Excellent. Well, Warren, um, it seems to be the end of the questions rolling in, which is fantastic. It sort of got us to time. Just so everybody's aware, we shared a little bit at the start. We, uh, we've got a, two more of these with Warren lined up. Oh, I've got one last question here for you. I'll publish that as I'm wrapping up here. There you go, Warren. Um, We've got two more of these sessions coming your way, so stay tuned for those. Um, there will be email updates coming to you via the CSIA's uh, Snow Pro email, and we will share about those uh, upcoming sessions on the CSI Ontario uh, social media feed, so catch us on Facebook and Instagram. And, um, yeah, we hope you've enjoyed tonight. I know there have been uh, a number of thank yous to you, Warren, in the chat thread, so I'll let you remark on those afterwards. 
um, feel free to spin back through. I've seen some names from uh, all across the country. Uh, we do hope to push awareness of these sessions out to the other regions um, for the upcoming sessions. So we may have a few new faces from, uh, from further abroad next time. And maybe with that, thank you from uh, CSI Ontario for everyone being here tonight. And Warren, if I can leave you with the last question tonight uh, from, uh, from Alan there, uh, Alan. we can wrap on that. But thank okay, you. Okay, so we'll answer this one and then that'll be the evening. Alan, thanks for your question. The, the way I see skiing is our skis are in contact with the snow, right? And the arc that they take is determined, right? So we, either by our moves or, right? But it's the ski that's always in contact with the snow. Therefore, if I, so if this is my ski here and here's my body, if I tip the ski over and let's call, you know, let's see this part of my hand, if that's my center of mass, my center of mass is from a two-dimensional view. So you standing at the bottom of the hill, it looks like the center of mass moves inside the base of support. Um, if unless our center of mass was a fixed point, uh, you know, on a cable or something like that, it's impossible other than hopping off the snow to displace your feet and keep your center of mass in one spot. Because remember, the center of mass is it's a fictional spot right it's a, the sum of all points so it's not it's not a it's not a thing right it's just a reference point so if we ski from the ground up when i tip the ski over the center of mass from a two-dimensional standpoint will look like it goes inside my base of support um so that's where we're so an inclination is not the move the move is rolling the foot, using the adductors to bring the ski over, um, that creates a line of inclination. Again, that's just a reference uh, point. It's not a move. The move is tipping the ski over. And how you react to that with the body uh, to balance against the outside ski, that connection would give you what we would call you know, the old look of angulation. So hopefully that answers your question. And again, thank you everybody for, for being here. There's still 70 people on. That's incredible. Uh, I really appreciate it. You reach out to the Ontario board or directly to myself. Uh, my email address was up there. Uh, if you have any questions or anything like that, or you know, if you want to see something improved upon, maybe I, I saw initially there were some questions about you know the platform we we're using and things like that. Those are best to send to the Ontario board. But I hope you had a wonderful evening and uh, have a great safe season. Maybe I'll see you in Ontario. Have a good evening.